Hey everybody, um, I just wanted to come in and take a minute to make a video response to another video I saw yesterday. Now normally I would just come in and comment on his video, but unfortunately they were disabled on the video. I'm not going to give you a hard time about that because I know how cruel people on YouTube can be, honestly. It's like people, there's, there's just no respect anymore. But um, normally I would just shoot from the hip. And just start rambling on about you know maybe how I felt about something but I'm not gonna do that this time and the reason why is because this this video was very personal to me and um, enough so that I really stopped and and started taking notes on everything that I took issue with I'm not really offended because I can tell just by the video that was made that um, there's really not a lot of knowledge there or, or firsthand or personal uh, experience attached to this because if there was I think it would have been come across a little bit differently so I'm not offended by what was said but I do want to take a minute and just really go over things as coherently as possible and make a few points and maybe just kind of tell you you know how I feel about it so anyways uh, that having been said let's get into it uh, so I will be reading for some from something where normally I would just be looking at you and talking So if I'm looking down, it's because I'm reading my notes and the reason why is because I don't want this to be a three-hour long video I want to get through my notes say what I need to say and hopefully Reach out to this guy and if anybody knows him Please share this video with him because it's really important that that he gets some clarity on who these people really are because what he's doing is he's bashing an entire movement based on a few things he's heard or seen but he's not really understanding that there is a whole lot of people attached to this movement that he is bashing and he's not the only one there's several of them on YouTube who are bashing this movement so anyway uh, this person this video was made by somebody called Naftali 1981 and I've seen his videos before normally he's a very good teacher you know whatever um, I've never had an issue with his videos like I said before this one was very personal to me because this video was called Hebrew Roots Deception um, have you ever met anybody who practices Hebrew roots personally or, or sat down and, and talk to them and kind of see what they think? Um, because the first response that I had to the video was, well, we don't say that and we don't do that. We don't think that. Um, so basically I've been studying Hebrew roots for about two years now. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have never dealt with the people that you were speaking of. I, I don't know those people. I'm not saying they don't exist. But I will say that, uh, let's start by saying that there are bad teachers in every sect of Christianity. And yes, we are still Christians, but we tend to call ourselves followers of Messiah because we don't follow doctrines of men. Christianity is a doctrine of men. It was instituted by the Roman Catholic Church. Christianity did not exist when Jesus, when his disciples, all of that stuff was going on. They were referred to as the way. They were not referred to as the Christians. Um, that came later and because nobody knew what to call them, just like nobody knows what to call us, okay? Um, so let's get into this. Um, we have our bad share of teachers. I'm not going to lie about it. We, we're just like any other sect of Christianity, and there's bad teachers everywhere. We have we're, we have no shortage of bad teachers in the Hebrew roots, and I think a lot of that comes to the fact that we are so overwhelmed by what we learn and what we come into the understanding that we come into from actually reading our Bibles and putting the Old and New Testaments together. We're so overwhelmed by it. And sometimes we tend to forget, and I even have this problem myself, sometimes we tend to forget that, you know, not everybody is where we are yet. And not even not even everybody even has the inclination to be where we are. They they are just kind of stagnant in their faith. So we have to remember and we have to be patient with those people instead of just be like, well, you're pagan. You're doing pagan stuff. No, no. There's got to be a completely different approach to how we bring that information. A big way that I've started bringing information to people is by asking them questions. Instead of just telling them what I know, 
I kind of ask them questions and and believe me when I say I do have a lot of I have a lot of completely non-believing friends I have a lot of Christian friends who who don't understand what it actually means to be a Christian I have a lot of atheist friends I have a lot of uh, friends who are Jewish I have I have a lot of different types of people in my life so I take a little bit I glean a little bit from all of them but I do try to influence what I do know and what I have have learned on them by asking them questions that make them think so you know and it wasn't always like that for me in the beginning I was like the Mack truck of evangelism I was just like you're gonna go to hell you're going to church on Sunday oh my god you're keeping Christmas you know what we have to be patient with our brothers and sisters in this movement and I completely agree with you on that so let me just tell you I can't speak for everybody in the movement but I can tell you where the movement has brought me personally I feel more connected to Messiah than ever before in my life uh, I have an understanding of the of the things I have an understanding of the desire to do the things that I do uh, I know the Bible like never before and um, because of listening to teachers who actually made me want to open my Bible and check the information see if it was accurate because what I was hearing was so new that I was like wait a minute I've never heard this in a Christian church what is this I, and, and it actually forced me it forced me to be a good student and open my Bible well I will tell you I was shocked at the discrepancies that are being taught in the church from the Bible and a lot of it comes from just not having an understanding of Torah we are so disconnected from the roots of our faith we've put all of our stock into something that that uh, the Apostle Paul has written that is so hard to to understand and if you don't know the context of the rest of your Bible you will never understand Paul ever you will read Paul and you will hear exactly what you want to hear you will hear that you're saved by grace and that nothing else is expected of you on your part and that is a false doctrine you want to talk about heresy that's a heresy and in fact that's not what Paul was teaching okay because they tried to kill Paul for teaching that exact doctrine they tried to kill him and he says no I have worshiped the the God of my fathers I believe all things that are written in the Torah and the prophets he was emphatic I am NOT teaching this heresy the heresy that 90% of Christians follow today is a false doctrine okay you're following a, a faith that teaches against the Torah the Torah is God's Word and I'm gonna get into that a little bit deeper too because I have a point to make about that anyways so I'm not even gonna deal with that let me just tell you uh, six short years ago my family was on the verge of shattering my husband and I were sleeping in separate rooms I've been with the same man for over 20 years he's the love of my life but we were going through a crisis I wasn't a believer he wasn't a believer our kids had no faith in anything so everything was falling apart we were at a crossroads in our lives and I knew something had to change I knew it so anyways uh, my oldest son he's autistic he was suicidal wanted to kill himself all the time come in my room crying broke my heart and then my other son was full of rage he was violent he had tempers my daughter going down the same road as every teenager in this country problem was she was only eight years old at the time okay they were listening to bad music watching bad stuff on TV hanging out with the wrong people so on and so forth it goes on and on and on but but I hope you can see just from there just the fruit of coming into obedience under this movement and what it's done in my life okay so just a little bit about my background and let's let's address some of your concerns now so let's bring up number one the selling of merchandise okay lots of ministries sell merchandise to make money uh, in fact the Calvary Chapel that I sometimes still attend was selling stuff including uh, the Word of God I mean they sell everything they put a price tag on everything you want to go to a conference it's gonna cost 150 bucks ministry trip that's gonna cost you 250 uh, you want to go to this Bible study great the cost is $40 that just yesterday we're selling uh, $20 coffee mugs I mean 
you're right. It's ridiculous. You shouldn't have to be selling all of this stuff to make ministry, but unfortunately, somebody's going to be more willing to go and buy a $20 coffee mug than they will be to give you a tithe of $20. I don't know what that deal is. You know what? We need to freely give, but you know what? As long as they feel like they're getting something for their money, I guess it's fine, but... But the point is, all ministries sell merchandise. And and yes, it's true. You mentioned Passion for Truth. They do sell their DVD series. Absolutely, they do. But every one of those DVD series is available on YouTube for free. Okay? Every single one of them. Okay, so that's the first one. Number two, you had a problem with uh, teaching in Hebrew, where they would, you know, tell you the meaning of a certain word in Hebrew. So what's wrong with that? Okay? What's wrong with teaching people Hebrew words for stuff? You Christians are always pulling up the Greek words. They mean nothing to me. I don't care about Greek. Why do I care about Greek? My Messiah wasn't Greek. He just happened to live in Rome. He was Hebrew. What's the problem with learning his language? And, you know, I like the fact that during the teachings, I'm learning the language of my Messiah. Also, he doesn't expect you to be in the dark about the language. He has... Certified Hebrew teachers, their videos are on YouTube for free. You can take Hebrew, if you so desire, for free. You can learn the alphabet, you can learn the, the paleopictograph, you can learn all of that stuff, and then you don't have to feel in the dark anymore. I, I don't even understand why that's a problem for you, honestly. Number three, how is learning about Christ, how is learning about who Christ was bad doctrine? I feel more connected understanding that Christ, who was a rabbi, by the way, all his disciples and most of the early converts were all Hebrew, every one of them. Paul was actually one of the most astute Pharisees who studied under Gamaliel. That meant he had to have the entire Torah memorized, frontwards and backwards. Paul knew more Torah than all of them put together. And he was Jesus. Jesus was Jesus. And Paul knew that Torah frontwards and backwards. Maybe if you studied a little bit more on Hebrew culture, the New Testament would make a little bit more sense to you. Okay, and I'm not saying that to be condescending. I'm just saying that maybe that might be one of the problems that we're having here in separation. Um, number four, <laughs> the sacred namers. I agree with you on these people. These people would be a perfect example of what I'm talking about when I say we have bad teachers in our sect. Um, I didn't receive, I, I, you know, one person's ministry is very important to me. The fruit of their ministry is very important to me. Are they preaching a doctrine that's instilling hostility in their people or superiority in their people or hatred in their people? I, I, and you know what I do? I do that the same thing as I do with the Joel Osteen doctrine. I just turn it off. There's no fruit there. There is no good fruit to eat from there. I'm sorry. If somebody's telling you you can't go to heaven because you're not black, throw them in the toilet. If somebody's telling you that, you know, you can't go to heaven unless you speak in tongues, pfft, throw them in the toilet. I'm sorry. We have good and bad in every single sect. So let's move on from there. Um, number five, we do not keep Torah for salvation. Okay. It's real simple. If you're trying to do this, then you have indeed fallen from grace, okay? Anybody who is trying to save themselves on their own merits is lost. They're lost and they need to be saved. They need they need Jesus. I'm sorry. So, however, um, the reality is when the Spirit comes upon you, um, when it comes upon you, it becomes your desire to be obedient. Okay. The only difference is that studying the Torah, I understand that God has a much deeper idea of what being obedient looks like. Okay. That's the only difference. Okay. You guys think that, you know, if you go out and you, um, and you disciple people and you feed homeless people, you think that you're doing the work of God and you are. But you're only doing part of the work of God. You're only doing half of what is expected of you. You're only doing what has been told 
is expected of you. You're not reading what God expects from you. I'm sorry, you're just not. So God has a much deeper idea of what obedience looks like. Most Christians are just doing what they're what they what they know and that's fine and good, but be careful, Naphtali, because now a Hebrew roots Christian is standing in front of you and putting a mirror up in front of your face and bringing something to your attention. And now you will have no excuse later because somebody will have tried to warn you and you didn't heed the warning. Okay, so that's a very big thing. And that, that's not, I'm, I wanna clarify that I'm not saying that to be threatening. I'm actually using a scripture. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They're invisible, but they're clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, that's you and I, and nature, and animals, they're understood by the things that are made if you're looking, okay? Uh, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. His DNA is in us, okay? If we're not asking questions, then we're not really pursuing him. Okay, you need to understand that. Neither were they thankful. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed a line, hold on. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their own imaginations and their foolish hearts were darkened. Okay, that's a heavy scripture. That's Paul for you. And if you don't understand this, you're just going to read right through it. And I'm going to show you an example of what, when you did that earlier. Um, uh, so, so let's get into that right now. Number six, let's talk about Acts 15. Known to God from eternity are all the works, Torah. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things that are strangled, and from blood. And then you read right through the next verse as if it's non-existence when it says, For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him every in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. They knew they had to start small with the converts. These were polytheistic people who were worshiping pagan gods, and they had to get them under control without overwhelming them with the whole law at one time. They knew the converts would learn the rest of the law and the Torah every Shabbat because they were still meeting in the synagogues. I, 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 how do you not see that? How can you not see that? It's right there. It's in the book. Okay, number seven. There is nothing that says anywhere in the New Testament that says that I am not to read, study, or implement the scriptures, the Old Testament, in my life. You can't find that anywhere. It does not say anywhere in the New Testament that we don't need to read the scriptures. In fact... <laughs> In fact, uh, they speak of the scriptures 22 times in the New Testament. And the word scripture is used 53 times. Um, in Matthew 22, 29, Jesus equates not knowing the scriptures with not knowing the power of God. Hmm. Jesus said that. Not knowing the scriptures is equated to not knowing the power of God. Timothy 3.16 tells us all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. What scripture is he talking about? When he wrote that, the New Testament didn't exist. The scriptures are referring to the Old Testament, the Torah, the prophets, period. You can't fight that. Sorry. Number eight, you need to understand something else. Hebrew roots is not for everybody. It's, it's for people who really want to dig deep and understand their faith. Listen, when I came into this belief, it was the first time in my life that I wasn't trying to make puzzle pieces fit. They just fit. And it was amazing. I was totally overwhelmed 
when I realized how things all come together, it really was beautiful. It was like a symphony. I know that I cherish my Messiah even more now because I understand more now that it was never about me, but he made a way for me. He made a way for the Gentiles. It was never about us. He was coming looking for his lost sheep. Okay? It was our it was our fortune that those sheep just happened to be amongst our people. Okay? Cuz that's how they made a way for us. Ah. Uh, anyways, now I will work out my salvation for the rest of the days out of sheer reverence and obedience to the Most High. Philippians 2.12 tells us to do just that. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You need to work at your salvation. Once saved, always saved. God doesn't even know what that means. God doesn't know what that means. He doesn't understand what that means. That's a man-made doctrine. Okay? Number nine, this is not a works-based salvation. I have personally never heard one of the teachers I listen to that has ever told me I need to keep Torah for salvation. It's a ridiculous notion. But the problem comes in when a Christian hears that something is expected of them. They don't want to hear about works. They don't want to hear about law. They don't want to hear about the commandments. However, the New Testament talks about works, the law, and keeping the commandments. And if we don't work out our salvation, then why are there two books opened on Judgment Day? Revelation 20.12 says, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books, books were open. And another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. By the things which were written in the books. Everything you do and everything you choose not to do is written in that book. I don't want to stand before my king on judgment day and say, and have to account for the person that I could have been. I want to be that person now. We are judged on how we keep God's commandments. We're going to be judged on that. All right, this is a big one. It's spiritual warfare. Um, you mentioned Jim Staley's dream and what his wife saw as well. Let me tell you one thing. When you come into this movement, your heart is motivated by truth and a desire to get close to your king. Uh, the enemy does not like that. He doesn't like it one bit. And he is going to torment you. And he is going to come after you. And he is going to try and fear you back into submission. Okay? Uh, my entire family came under heavy spiritual warfare. In fact, it felt like we didn't sleep for probably about three months. Because every single night we had to deal with this problem coming into this coming into this truth, coming into the Bible, digging deeper, studying more. We were entering the spiritual realm, okay? That's what people don't understand is that by coming into this movement, you are digging deep into the spiritual realm, okay? And that wakes people, that wakes up spirits, okay? And you're going to have to deal with them. Uh, I had one woman who actually fought with me over this and said that, uh, it was happening because God was mad at her and he was allowing the devil to torture her. Really? Really? That's plausible to you? God's mad at you? God's mad at you for getting to know him and obeying his commandments? So he's going to let the devil come after you? Really? Where is the logic in that statement? I don't even know. Anyway, they look at this as a curse when in fact the devil is coming unglued. He doesn't know what to do because he knows that when you come into the truth, you are so far from his grasp, he can't get to you anymore. He can't fight the truth because he's the father of lies. So he's going to do his best to torment you, to scare you, to try and bring you back into submission. And you've got to fight him. Um, we, we, got, we got afflicted most, most, almost on a nightly basis. We stood strong, we prayed, we rebuked, we prayed again. Eventually they left and they have not come back. I stand fierce in my house because I have felt the power of Christ move within my walls. Okay? I don't know about you, but once you come through that, you, are con you have just entered soldier status. 
You can take on anything in the flesh because you have battled in the spiritual realm and you have come out victorious because of Jesus Christ, Mashiach. That's who brought you through it. Okay, you trusted in him, you rebuked in his name, and it doesn't matter if you rebuked in Jesus Christ, Yeshua Hamashiach, uh, Jesus, it don't even matter what name you use because he knows his name and he knows when you're calling on him. What difference does it make what language I say it in? Eh, whatever. Uh, so eventually they left, they didn't come back and, and you know what? Jim Staley actually could have been being uh, threatened at that moment because of the vision he was having. You don't understand how the, if you have never battled in the spiritual realm, you do not understand how this works. You do not understand how much authority and how much power you actually have. So when you are actually having a vision, when something like that's happening, there is a demon standing literally right there frothing at the mouth. He's waiting for an opportunity to pounce on you and get inside of you. Trust me, because I have laid there in the dark and I have felt him right here, breathing on my face. Okay? I'm telling you, we either believe in this stuff or we do not believe in this stuff because you know what? If, if, if it wasn't real, then why would Paul have told us to prepare ourselves? to fight against the dark principalities and the evil rulers of this world. Okay? These are not flesh and blood people. These are spirits that we will have to fight. Okay? So, anyways, I, I wanted to pay a little bit of extra attention on that one because that, that was big. You know, I, I, I did this so that I wouldn't make an hour-long video like you, but I'm not being very, very successful on it. So, I'm sure this is going to be a two- to three-part video series. So, anyways... um. Number 11, Jesus does not make demands on us. We have free will. He never demanded anyone to do anything. Uh, but he does say in John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of my Father who sent me. Well, what's the, what's the Father's will? What's his doctrine? It's real simple. When God gave these instructions, his Torah... He said in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call on heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. He is saying that his instructions are life. Breaking his instructions are death. Okay? You can either have a blessing or you can have a curse. It really doesn't matter. Okay? Uh is is really simple just choose life uh so that both you and your descendants may live so number 12 false doctrine <laughs> i think that it is an absolute outrage that one would have the audacity to call the very word of god false doctrine it shows a blatant disregard for God's magnificence. And I think that's what bothered me most about this video. Is there's just a blatant disregard for God, his standards, his ways. You, you guys say that he's the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. But then you say, oh, he changed his mind. We don't have to do that anymore. It's, 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 it's absolute contradiction in terms. It's, it's. It's schizophrenic. You can't have it both ways. So anyways, um, believing in Hebrew roots causes us to cling to what God wanted for us all along. Then how is that a false doctrine? I think the real problem is simply that you don't understand what the Bible actually says and you have grafted yourself into the tree of Rome. And there's some spirituality there, don't get me wrong. But you, you guys don't understand that you're grafted into the wrong tree. You're supposed to be a Protestant, but you're grafted into Rome. Um, read chapter, uh, chapter 11 in Romans. And uh, this movement, it requires something on your part. It requires change. And well, let's face it, change is not a Christian strong suit. They're very complacent. They're very comfortable in their ideologies. They would never dream to question anything they believe. 
most of them are like that. I'm not saying all of them are like that because clearly I was able to escape that, that trap, that prison. But you know what? If it works for you, it works for you. But don't say that something doesn't work for me because it doesn't work for you. If, if that's what works for you and if, that, if, if you truly feel like you're serving the Father, I'm not going to condemn you. Go serve the Father. Go do what you're doing. Because, you know, I, I'm a very firm belief that there's seven churches in the book of Revelation for a reason. Because every one of us is going to fall into one of those churches. We're not all going to be the bride. Sorry. <laughs> I had to say it. We're not all going to be the bride of Christ. And there are going to be greatest and least in the kingdom of God. According to Jesus himself. I don't even need Paul to tell me that because Jesus told me that. Anyways, um, so anyways, uh, you, you, you call your churches Protestant and yet you live uh, under the yoke of Rome. You keep Rome's feast days. You keep Rome's Sabbath days. And you keep Rome's doctrine. You just don't call yourself a Catholic anymore. But you're a Catholic. So would it shock you if I told you that the Sabbaths are a special sign between God and his people throughout their generations forever. And you allow yourself to be robbed every year of that. Just something to think about. Um, so you showed a video in your video of all these different nationalities talking about Jesus Christ. Which I thought was interesting because here you were railing on me saying Jesus in Hebrew. But you were perfectly fine with all these people saying Jesus in their native language. So I just thought I'd make a point that that was a little hypocritical. All right. Now, number 14, you're going to have to follow me here. Okay. Jesus is the word. Okay. We can all agree that in the beginning was the word. What was the word? It was the Torah. God's word. The Old Testament. The Torah. Or the commandments, let's put it even simpler, became flesh and walked among us. His name was Jesus. So Jesus is quite simply the commandments of God in living form. He's manifested in a man's body. But he is the commandments of God. So when you say that God's commandments are burdensome or bondage, do you understand what you're really saying? Do you understand that you're actually saying that Jesus is bondage? That Jesus is a burden? Because Jesus was the Torah. It's right there in the book. I didn't make it up. And I will add that that is not something that I learned from somebody else. That's a revelation I received the other day. Because I don't think we think about it in simplistic terms like that. Let's just put the words together and connect the dots, shall we? Because Jesus is the Torah. If you're saying the Torah is a burden, then you're saying that Jesus is a burden. Okay? Number 15, the gospel where you were saved. All right, Naphtali, I've seen enough of your videos to know that you'll understand why the gospel I was saved under is not sufficient enough for me. Uh... I was saved in a hyper grace church. You know, I sat there and I listened to how you don't have to do anything, that you're free in Christ and saved by grace. And once saved, you, you're always saved and that you can never be separated from God. And I saw right through it. I'm sorry. You can be separated from God. It's called sinning. And yes, you guys can sit there and say that you're dead to sin all you want, but it doesn't change the fact that you're in sin. Um... I know what the word says, but I also know what you do. You have, not going to go off my script, just not going to do it. Anyways, so uh, I saw right through it. I knew there was something more because it didn't look like love to me. It really didn't. I mean, how were these people claiming to love someone and then never do the things that he likes? They don't keep his special feast days. They don't keep his Sabbath. They don't do anything he likes. 
Divorce is rampant in the church. And in fact, I looked at some statistics and divorce is more prominent in the Christian faith than in the regular secular world. It's like three points higher. That's just sad to me. And I found that out because my daughter was doing a devotional on, on broken families and stuff like that, you know. And it was really interesting when she pulled that up. I was like, those numbers have got to be wrong. And you know what? They were. Because my husband came home and informed me that they're even higher than the statistics she had pulled up. So that's a really tragic thing. Okay, so I know that the word says you're dead to sin, but you're living in sin. All of you. Sorry. Uh, anyways, um, so they didn't want to do anything that he likes. And this is God we're talking about. Even if it was never said that something was expected of me, I would still go out of my way to make that person happy. And let's face it, Christ coming and dying on a cross for me and for you, that initiates a response in me. That is initiates a desire in me to please him, to worship him, to honor him with all that I have, to present my body as a living sacrifice now, not later after I'm old and washed up and I'm ready to die. Now, I'm presenting my body as a living sacrifice now by not having a bacon cheeseburger. I'm presenting my body as a living sacrifice now by not cheating people, by not coveting, by keeping the Sabbath, by doing what I'm supposed to do, by listening to the Word of God. Call me crazy. Call me a heretic. <laughs> it's not about what you have to do. It's a desire to be obedient and to be in covenant with him, not a church doctrine. All right, so let's get into this because you brought up Jim Staley a lot. And in fact, you said you were going to bring up Michael Rood and you never did, which I'm kind of glad about because I've never even actually looked at Michael Rood's teaching. He kind of turned me off with his whole demeanor. So I never really got into Michael Rood's teachings. I have a few others, but Jim Staley is, is a wonderful teacher. Um... Uh, I'm not going to go into his personal life. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. But so you brought him up a lot. So I think I'm going to address it. I don't personally know Jim Staley. I've never ventured back there to meet the Mishpaka. I don't know any of them personally. I have corresponded with them and have gotten lovely responses from their ministry. I couldn't even get a response from my pastor at my local church. Just saying. But I've got people in the Midwest who are willing to stop what they're doing and send me emails. And they don't even know who I am. So that was kind of nice. That's a beautiful reception. So anyway, um, I can't speak to his heart. Um, but I have to be honest. This man, along with a couple other teachers, have taught me more in the last two years than I have known all my life about the Bible. Um, and that's not to say it's because I took everything they said at face value. Actually, it was just the opposite. Jim Staley made me want to study my Bible. What I was hearing from Jim Staley was so different and so new. I was like, how is it I've never heard this stuff before? I had to be astute. I had to go into my Bible because I had to make sure that what he was saying was real because it was unlike anything anything I had ever heard before. But at the same time, it was everything I already felt in my heart. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm not the only one who feels this way. There's a whole movement of people who feel this way. This is absolutely beautiful because this is something I felt when I left the church. I left the church way before I found Hebrew roots. I left the church when I felt in my very heart and soul that this was not where I was going to find God. This was not where I was going to serve God. There was nothing there for me. It was like just deadness. When I looked at the people, I saw hypocrisy. I saw do I saw Pharisees is what I saw. I saw do as I say, don't do as I do. That's what I saw. I saw an over glorification for sexuality. I saw an over glorification of hypocrisy. I saw all of that in the church and not just one church, several churches. It was nauseating and I felt dirty after going to church. 
That's how I felt. I felt like I went home and I was more confused by being in the church than I ever was by reading the writings of Paul. And that's pretty confused. Okay. So, um, I took everything he said and I was vigilant. I studied everything. I was vigilant. I would spend a couple days just on one video. <laughs> and his videos are long as they are. They're already an hour and a half long, but I would make a two-day study out of it because I wanted to make sure that what I was hearing was right, that what I was hearing was biblical. I don't want to be deceived. So I'm going to study myself and I'm going to find myself worthy and I'm, I'm going to do my due diligence and make sure that what I'm believing is actually coming from the book and not a pulpit. Okay? So anyways... Um, I would venture, uh, uh, you had said that you watched a couple of his videos, including Identity Crisis. Um, I would venture to say that I have watched every single one of Jim Staley's videos on YouTube. Um, and some of them I watched two and three times. Um, I'll be honest with you, Identity Crisis, I've watched that at least six times. In fact, Identity Crisis is the reason my husband finally got saved. Because he looked at me after watching that video and he goes, okay, you have my attention. After three years of being in the faith, that was the video that got Rick's attention. That was the video that made him just be like, it shook him to his core. You know why? Because it made sense to him. Christianity doesn't make sense to him. It never did. It just the the, hypo, the sheer hypocrisy of it never made sense to him. He wouldn't he wouldn't go to church. He didn't like the church. So, anyways, um, Jim Staley has never told me that I have to keep Torah for salvation. Mm -mm. It's always something we do out of obedience, and even if we can't implement the entire Torah, we're going to live by those standards because those are God's standards. Those are not the Baptist church standards. Those are not the charismatic church standards. Those are not the Catholic church standards. Those are Yahweh's standards. His standards trump every denomination's standards, every single one. So, um, he's never told me I have to keep sore. He's also never told me that I have to say the name a certain way. In fact, he's never told me that I have to say Yeshua. In fact, a lot of times he says Jesus. And uh, also know that Passion for Truth Ministries also has two other pastors. It's not just Jim Staley. Um, every pastor there is amazingly blessed and anointed, and, and I love their teachings. They are incredibly thorough on their teachings, which is why they don't rush through a 20-minute sermon so you can get home in time to watch Sunday football. Their sermons are like an hour and a half long because there's so much detail they go into, whether it be Hebrew culture, whether it be historical fact, whether it be all the Bible verses they have to show you to correlate with what they're saying their teachings are not rushed okay they are very thorough okay so I would venture to say that he is honestly one of the greatest teachers I have ever come across in any sect of Christianity he is graceful he is respectful and he is loving and everything he brings to you he brings to you in love and I respect him for that above all things I respect him for that Okay, so um, please do not discount their ministry simply because you don't understand them. Okay, watch the rest of his videos and actually open your Bible. Prove him wrong. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you're so sure about what you're saying, prove them wrong. Because you, I've yet to come across a verse that can prove what they're saying is wrong. You can't do it. So um, let's see here. In closing, I just need to ask if this sounds like something a false teacher would say. Excuse me, I really need a drink. Ah. These are just a couple of the daily devotionals I've received from Passion for Truth on Facebook. And I have to say it's wonderful to see these words in the morning when you're starting your day. The first one is, do you feel like you're falling apart? Trust Yeshua. Who? Trust Yeshua. 
Oh, that's Jesus. They talk about Jesus. <laughs> and follow him. He knows how to put you back together. Every shattered piece. The next one is Yeshua is our salvation. Does it say Torah is our salvation? No. It says Yeshua is our salvation. We are accepted and declared righteous by grace through faith in him alone. That's what we believe. I'm sorry if something else caught your attention, but that's our core belief. We are accepted and declared righteous through great, by grace through faith in him alone. Our obedience to his Torah is simply the result of a transformed life in Messiah. Yeshua didn't come to take away God's standards of righteousness. He came to save us and therefore empower us to walk in them. Then uh, Romans six seventeen says, Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves to righteousness. You only become sinless when you walk by righteousness. The only definition of righteousness was the Torah. Sorry, just bringing scripture. And just one more uh, for, for my sake of making a point. You must absorb the love of God in your life or you will never be set free. Some of you are hurting like there's no tomorrow. Your heart feels ready to explode. It's the same answer. Believe in Yeshua and the power of the resurrection and ask him to come into your life and give you love and he will save you. I could go on and on, but we'll leave it there for now. Naphtali, after all of this has been said, I would like to encourage you, if you have concerns about the Hebrew Roots Movement and our teachings, to actually go to a source and debate them, okay? If it's one thing I know about this movement, it's that they love to share what they've learned about Messiah. There's a guy named Zach. His channel is New Number Two Torah. He's on YouTube. You can also go to newtotorah.com. I know Zach would love to debate you. He's an amazing guy. He is uh, formerly a Baptist preacher, and he has now come into Torah. He talks very respectfully with everyone I've ever heard him debate. Um, get the real story. Don't put up videos that are an hour long with so much defamatory information with nobody there to stand up for themselves. And then disable the comments so we can't even lovingly correct you. It's really unfair. Remember, even though we have come into an understanding that you have not reached yet, that we are still brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? And everybody deserves respect. Everybody deserves to confront their accusers, which is why I've made this video. Okay? So I'm going to leave it there for now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, and may he be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Peace to you. I really hope this video gets to you, and please reach out to myself or reach out to, like I said, Zach from New to Torah, and debate somebody. You know, the reason this movement is stirring and raising so many questions and, and, and fluffing up so many people's feathers is because it's 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 different and it's stirring a response in you have you ever questioned whether or not maybe that's the holy spirit trying to wake you up and to get you out of your rut get with somebody who can show you we're going to show you what we've learned okay we want to show people what we've learned we want them to come out of bondage okay there's going to be a great gathering at the end of times of, of a remnant. And this remnant is talked about, Revelation uh, 12, 17. This remnant is talked about several times in the book of Revelation. This remnant is prophesied to come back into covenant in the end days. Okay? And when the dragon is wrath with this remnant who keeps the commandments and carries the testimony of Jesus Christ. Does that sound like your church? No, that sounds like my church. So all I'm asking you is to use 
your brain that God gave you. He tells us in Hosea, my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. This is something that you really need to dig on. This is something that I bet you, if you really started to look into, you would be amazed at the power of God that is working right now in this world. You would be amazed. So anyways, God bless you. I love you all. I'm so sorry that this video turned out to be an hour long, almost as long as yours, Naphtali. Yours was 53 and change. Mine is 51 by the time I say goodbye again. So, all right, God bless you guys, and I'll talk to you soon.